Um, I work within the private equity group of Grant Thornton, and I'll be moderating this esteemed panel. Uh, we're going to make introductions, etc., quick, because I know that uh, everybody's got a lot of questions, uh, and probably the more interactive this panel is, the better. But before we begin, let me ask who in the room here would consider themselves entrepreneurs? Who in the room here would consider themselves entrepreneurs? Really? Okay. Who in the room here would consider themselves investors? Okay. And how many established companies invest in, uh, that work within this market? How many people here from Grant Thornton? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Um, I will tell you that real quickly that Grant Thornton is excited to be here because uh, the more investors, the more entrepreneurs, and the better that this marketplace is means that there's more transactions. And we work within all aspects of transactions. From deal flow activity, to due diligence when you find your deal, to auditing and tax work after you acquire companies, to integration with other portfolio companies, and to post-acquisition consulting work. All those areas we work with. And if you have any questions about that, you can ask either myself or my colleagues up there. Um, what I think the way that we're gonna do this is we're gonna have introductions from our panelists. I'll ask a few questions that I'm sure are on everybody's mind, and then we're gonna open up the rest. Good evening, everyone. I'm Deb Citrin, and I'm with Phillips. And I have about 20 years now in the space of aging. I've been associated with the lifeline business, so the personal emergency response or medical event business for 20 years. Uh, joined Phillips when they acquired Lifeline. At the point in time when they recognized about 10 years ago that as a health tech company, they needed to um, kind of pivot from what was really a hospital-focused healthcare business to one that needed to have solutions that was along the continuum of care from prevention to maintenance in the home and the provision of care in the home. So I've had the benefit of uh, going from a small standalone company or a medium sized medium sized small uh, company to now working within a large multinational company, uh, leading marketing departments and also being involved with strategy and business development. And right now I'm leading a internal venture in the space of elderly care solutions. So learning what it's like to try to be almost like a startup but not working with people that are startup mentality. It's, it's a very interesting dilemma when you're inside a big company trying to move with speed, but people are compensated in the same old ways. Um, but I, I do want to say something about this aging space. One was an observation. We had 10 panelists in the last session. How many were men? Two. There was two. There was the moderator and one participant. To me, that was very telling about this space of the longevity market. And it corresponds probably um, to the demographics related to who the caregivers are. It's not nine to one, but it's probably more like seven to three or six to four. I know the perspectives. So. As we look around the room, we still have, we have a better mix than we did on the panel, but this becomes an issue for women. And as you're thinking about, and we had the entrepreneurs raise their hand, your market, your target is understanding women and women as buyers, or the businesses that are trying to approach women as buyers. So I'll hand it off to Kim. Thanks. My name is Katie Fike, and I'm the co-founder of Aging 2.0 and a partner with Generator Ventures. Aging 2.0 is a global innovation network. Um, we cultivate and 
support and educate entrepreneurs who are working in this space. We've run about 85 events in 14 countries, um, in 22 cities, meeting entrepreneurs from all around the world, the active chapters going. And then we run a startup accelerator program where we work with 20 startups at a time and help them with everything from business development, product development, PR, and funding. And then we also have Generator Ventures, um, which is our venture arm that we launched in May of last year in conjunction with Formation Capital, which is a large private equity investor in this space. And we've made 10 investments so far in startups in the space. So we're really trying to help cultivate the ecosystem, support those entrepreneurs, help them overcome the barriers to getting to market in this space, and really trying to accelerate the products that we think are really needed. Thanks, Katie. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Kung. And, and like Deb, I've been in aging for about 20 years, first as a caregiver in a nursing home, and more recently, um, I've been an entrepreneur in this space. Uh, I started a company called Clear Care Online, which if you've heard of um, Home Instead, Comfort Keepers, Visiting Angels, Right at Home, they all run the Clear Care system to run their businesses, payroll, billing, scheduling, uh, family portals. Um, and that's going really well. Uh, and as an entrepreneur, uh, since it's going really well, all my investors will be paid well. Um, I went and started, a, I tried to start another company, and that was called Illume Healthcare, and that one failed. So we closed that down. Uh, and then as an entrepreneur, I had to figure out what to do next. So, because I used to run a retirement community, and I used to be the long-term care person at McKinsey, a consulting firm, um, I've been consulting now. So, uh, I have six clients, and I've been helping to launch new programs and new businesses within big companies, which is very interesting, um, as well as smaller companies. Um, for those students in the room, uh, I, my undergrad dorm was across the river. I was here at HBS, my dorm was two buildings down. I uh, got a doctorate from Hopkins. And so my best friend, because it's Harvard undergrad, Harvard Business School, Hopkins PhD, she calls me Preparation H. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so nice to be here. Thank you. Um, my name is Mark Sablatsky, and actually I'm HBS 92, and actually HBS is the only, the only degree I have. So um, that's also why I'm actually new to aging. So I, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a um, experienced clinician. Um, basically, my focus is really, uh, for my whole career, has been building business, consider myself an entrepreneur, and I was brought in um, to head up a private equity funded initiative called PsyQs. And basically, PsyQs can enable any website with Zoom and speech and a variety of other assistive technologies so that people that are older um, can basically customize the view of that website and actually use it the way they need to use it. So we, it's, it's, there's, we've applied for around 21 patents associated with this technology, and we can literally get any website up and running with a fully functioning additional set of functionality for boomers and seniors uh, in less than an hour. Uh, but what I found interesting from the panel was the discussion that was brought up near the end about the intersection between disabilities and aging um, and the concept of universal design. Um, this product really comes out of a folk, our, our, our uh, parent company is a company called AI Square, Square, and they make a product called ZoomText, which basically, if you have low vision, um, the only way that you can actually go back to work and basically use your computer is if you used our desktop application called ZoomText. Um, and what we've done is we've applied that technology and that learning of, since 1987 to figure out ways to make the web easier for seniors and boomers that are having, but not necessarily disabled, they're just having a lot of difficulty doing the same thing in the same period of time as working age adults. There was a study done that said it took a senior 43% longer to do the same transaction as a working age adult online. Well, that's not right. But the reality is, is website um, designers and owners and organizations aren't going to redesign their entire um, website just for the seniors and boomers, and that's why the concept of universal design is so important. Um, that. Thanks. Um, just a few questions. Um, I know most of this panel has had a vast experience in this market, uh, some over 20 years. Um, but I'll ask this of Mark and Jacqueline, being the entrepreneurs. Why now? 
What's different now in the quote unquote aging market that you've seen that makes it attractive? It, that's such a great question. Uh, typically what you hear when you go to VCs and, oh, you know, demographics, silver tsunami, <coughs> all of that is true. But I think really right now is the announcement that Obama made a few weeks ago where most of Medicare will be moved towards value-based payments within two or three years. And that only happened a few years ago, so the number of calls I've gotten in the last two or three weeks has accelerated from hospitals, from insurance companies. It's been remarkable. And the reason why that's important is in the aging market, you know, it was referenced in the session right before this, there are so many different consumers, oh, excuse me, so many different uh, potential buyers. Historically, other than Lifeline and a couple other products, consumers have not you know, paid money for things. Um, insurance companies have also not paid money for a lot of these products. There, haven't, and there hasn't been traditionally a buyer, and it's been hard for companies, including ClearCare, um, and, and clearly my failed company, Illume, to start. But now I think it's going to be really different because of this announcement that Obama made a few weeks ago. And that will change because you have at least a trillion dollars going into this now. That's a lot of money. So why now? I think that's a big reason. I think that with our organization it's a little bit different. Um, the reality is, is if we don't act, then our, the, basically our company goes away. Because basically our core company is desktop applications and basically everything's moving to the web and then to mobile. And so we had to figure out how to change the technology and the delivery system of how we were making our products to benefit more people rather than one person at a time on a desktop, figure out how to apply that learning and that knowledge to you know, millions of people at one time as opposed to an assessment that happens with one person. You know, in, in the disability space, you, know, you, you need to get assessed. Once you get assessed, then someone is, the government or someone is going to fund uh, the technology that you need to basically work on a computer, but since everything's moving away from the desktop, uh, we, our private equity backers that own the company, basically invested in what is the next generation of our organization. The next generation is going from desktop to software as a service. And this is for Deb and Katie. Um, I think we're probably going to get into some of the questions about great opportunities in the marketplace, uh, so I'm not going to ask that question. The question is, what opportunities are perceived in the marketplace as good that you think are not good? <laughs> um, well, I would say, and I kind of forgot to skip over my background, but I think it gives me a unique perspective in this space. I was an engineer in undergrad, did investment banking for a few years and then switched gears and went back and did my master's and PhD in gerontology. And I, I look now for opportunities that, like what Jacqueline said, they're this intersection of, we see the demographics, we see a solution, some scalable technology solution to address it, and we see a market that has a buyer. Not just a large market, but a market that's willing to pay for something. And um, so I think there's a lot of ideas out there that haven't figured out their business model or who's going to pay. I think that's changing with accountable care. Um, I also always have to be very careful on an area that I think is a little dicey is the aging in place trend, which is what we know everybody say they want, but there's kind of this counterbalance of loneliness and isolation. And I think, you know, how do we balance that as a society of supporting where people want to age, but also making sure that we're not just um, aging in isolation. And so I think technology can help us stay connected there. But it's an area where I think if you blindly say, Aging in place is what we're going for. You have to think about the unintended consequences of that. I think the other thing is recognizing you actually have two buyers. Um, and if you point your sites only to, let's say, a family caregiver, then you're going to fail. Uh, because unlike child care, when you can tell the child what he or she will do or what he or she will wear, you cannot tell an aging parent or relative that same thing. So one of the things we have to be very good at is meeting the needs of that caregiver, as we talked about in the panel, 
but also recognizing that the senior, that person aging who has that desire to age in place, is actually part of the consumer um, uh, stakeholder loop. And finding that winning combination of how you bring that senior, that aging parent along on the decision making is really the magic. So it's not just the what the thing is, it's how you convince those multiple stakeholders on why it's important for them. Um, with that, I think that um, let's start our interactive part and open it up. Go ahead. Uh, Matt Mulaney with Senior Link. Um, I want to go back to something that Jane Barlow from CBS said in her talk. She said that she goes over to her mom's house and fills the pill box, which is free labor for CBS, assuming CBS PBM were her mom's PBM. And it's hard to get. It's pretty good ROI on free, even if the caregiver isn't expert, right? So um, we work in the Medicaid long-term services model now, Medicaid pays for a lot of long-term care in this country, and are thinking about how to bring that experience beyond. But you've got a lot of payers who will say to us, you know, I like your model for this niche, but everything else I'm getting is free. Um, how do you think about that, that, that problem? And, I mean, part of it is demonstrating that you could really make a difference, right? But um, I'll, I'll stop talking and let you kind of feel that. So which problem or in particular, how we should get caregivers to actually pay for things, or if we should pay out of pocket for some of these solutions that are currently done by free caregivers? Well, I guess it's two questions. One is, to what extent do you see this as a consumer market versus a, a business or sponsor market? Um, is it... Jane Barlow or is it CBS, you know, the BBM is really going to be writing the check. Mm -hmm. And then where do you see if it's businesses like CBS, BBM, them having a willingness to pay to make more efficient, longer lasting things that they're now getting for free, like her health bill and the I'm going to hand it to Jacqueline because she was talking about how Obama's recent comments in terms of moving to a value based model comes right into this from a payer, an institutional payer, but it is both at some point along the scale. Great, thank you. That's such a good question. You know, it, a lot of the family caregiver help is free, uh, but things slip through the cracks a lot as well. Um, so if that family caregiver doesn't do something one week, uh, a hospitalization might happen. Right? So many things happen because that family caregiver's working, they're taking care of their kids, so things slip through the cracks. Um, so much so that you'll actually see um, some uh, hospitals, insurance companies thinking about paying the family member to help with the care, but um, as many of you know here in Massachusetts, um, and Jody, maybe you, um, you know, know which year, but in the last year or two, um, states like Massachusetts um, and four or five other states have actually started paying family caregivers. It comes to about six or seven dollars an hour, so it's still less than minimum wage, but it's more than free. And the reason is because they find that that cost offsets things falling through the cracks. So we'll see more of this happening along with, as Deb highlights, you know, uh, the traditional um, more established companies coming to realize some of the benefits of uh, providing a little bit of value to the family caregiver for that help. For that help. And one of the things that we might see, and it's within the funded model, uh, where families will get exposed to services or products that can help them with caregiving. So there may be a period of funded support, um, depending on whether or not it's 90 days after a hospitalization or longer, but they'll get exposed to tools and resources that they can tap into in either a full pay or a co-pay methodology over time. I just add, you know, a lot of the startups we meet initially think they're going to be B2B or B2C and go direct to consumer, and then they find that there's not a lot of established chan channels there, so then they shift gears and say, I'm going to try to go B2B or B2B2C and find partners who already have aggregated groups of older adults. And frankly, what we often kind of advise is, even though it's 
hard for a team, and you, on one hand we're saying focus, 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 oftentimes what a lot of them will do is try to develop something that someone will open their wallet for today, um, something that they truly want and they see the immediate benefit of, while at the same time, be gathering the data and the outcomes to start proving that you're decreasing or improving some outcome that matters to someone who's going to be one of these risk-bearing entities. And I think as that changes, you know, they're going to start paying for things they weren't paying for before. But it's still, if you're starting your business today, you need another revenue stream that's not reliant on the ACO model because that's still kind of finding its way and you need to be proving your outcomes now. So a lot of our startups are doing a little bit of direct consumer they have found some initial B2B customer who they're doing some rigorous piloting and outcome measures with, and then with their long-term goal being hopefully be part of some sort of bundle payment or ideally funded by on the a public side. Go ahead. Um, okay, so it's been a very exciting time here. It's a complicated market, a lot of moving pieces, a lot of moving pieces moving quickly. And Deb, I really appreciate your comment about connecting with the elder and connecting with the family, right? So here's a couple of questions I have in three parts, and I'd really love to hear all of your opinions on this. There's a lot of other trends in play here that haven't been mentioned this evening, and I think it's worthwhile for the rest of us to hear. Whether it's the rise of snack technologies, the increase in brain health challenges, and all of the solutions to address the brain health challenges, which obviously go along with the population, um, potential reinvention of gerontology along with that to address what the real health issues are of the real aging population today. So just to be very forward looking in our discussion, my questions are first, where are the trends that really matter that we ought to be paying attention to? We get over the obvious trend that people are aging. And, um, so let's, let's hear about the other trends that we really ought to be paying attention to. Two is the psychosocial issues. So I'm not so concerned about the functional activities of daily living. It's really the loneliness. It's a hands-on issue. And how do we go about solving this dramatic hands-on issue, which is related to the third point, which is a huge workforce shortage. We don't have enough family caregivers now, nevertheless looking into the future. So I'm not so concerned about talking about how do we help the family caregivers when there's yet to emerge a new labor force to fix the whole equation. So I just wanted to move the whole conversation a little bit forward to address some of those. There you go. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll start only because I'm closest to the mic. That, that's about it. Um, you bring up some very uh, interesting points. Um, first on the workforce shortage. It's not just family caregivers. It is a shortage of hands-on caregivers, across the board, paid or otherwise. Just, just the facts. So that's not going away. Um, and so therefore, we have to think creatively and be innovative in the way that we help care for people who today are being cared for with hands-on help, either paid or unpaid. And there are going to be different models that um, um, appear uh, in terms of the communities in which we live in and how uh, moving closer but not being in what I'll call um, the traditional brick and mortar worlds of assisted living where only a small percentage of seniors can actually afford to live in. So it's taking care of very few. Or the bottom, which is Medicaid and funded in skilled nursing where nobody ever wants to go. So there has to be new models in terms of community living that address this, okay? The second part is going to have to be how do we utilize technology to substitute hands-on care where possible. And it's not gonna be a 100% substitute. It's not the George Jetson of the world, even though we might get there. But in the lifetime of most of us in the room, it may get there partially, but not completely. So we've gotta figure out how technology allows us to use the hands-on care smart and efficiently. So that has to happen. Um, and then you bring in the other part, which is when you start removing the hands-on care component, you're left with people with mobility issues that make them more and more isolated. Mobility and 
cognitive decline issues, in which your world becomes smaller, smaller, and shut in. And as a society, and before we actually started the panel, I was talking to, I think, uh, we were, Sally, we were talking about the fact that one of the biggest health issues that we have in aging populations is the impact of isolation and loneliness and depression, and how that magnifies and is only treated once it turns into a medical condition. And as a society, we have to find ways <coughs> to address the issues related to isolation and loneliness before they become medical issues. And I think technology will play a part because as the boomers age, as we age with the use of uh, virtual communities and technologies in our pockets, <coughs> it's going to be different for that generation in terms of how to address their world shrinking, the, in, the limitations of mobility, and it will get different. Our biggest problem is the next 10 years. Because if we go back to that question of what is old, and we heard the age was, only one person said 75, and it was Professor Hill. But everyone was 85 and older. And so we still have a bit of a, a one or a two decade issue ahead of us to address a generation of seniors, of the older adults, who aren't readily adopted the technologies that could help with isolation and loneliness. Okay, great questions. Uh, you know, I, I look a lot for things that change these supply and demand ratios and our care ratios. If we look right now at care in our country, it's hands-on, one-on-one, and that's just not scalable. Um, and it's also not economical for the families. A lot of people can't afford, you know, one person in their house for multiple hours. And uh, so I look at other models where we've seen changes in supply and demand, and I think Two interesting examples would be Uber and Lyft. It has brought online a whole new set of the drivers, you know, direct people who never would have been a taxi driver are now being Uber drivers. How can we redefine caregiving in a way that Uber redefined being a driver? Similarly, if you look at Airbnb, also disrupted a whole industry by changing supply and demand um, dynamics by bringing online this whole new set of rooms. And so I think we need to think about how can we change the caregiving profession in a way that it will attract more people um, and also make it more economical and accessible to people. So I think the Uberization of caregiving will happen. I think right now most non-medical home care is you know, um, parceled out in two and three and four hour minimums. I think we'll, we'll move to a time where there might be sensors triggering the need for something and someone comes to my house and does something for 15 minutes and then leaves and doesn't sit on my couch until the next time I need something done. So I, my husband jokes you can't take me anywhere without me talking about incontinence innovation, um, <laughs> which I think is a huge opportunity. Um, but one of the companies we do some work with um, is actually making smart sensors in a brief. And you know, you could think about a time when instead of Uber drivers riding around, there's caregivers driving around, the sensor could say, Ms. Johnson needs to be changed, someone could drive to their house and do that right away. And so I think we're gonna have to get much smarter about how we um, deploy these scarce human resources, because I think we're doing it rather inefficiently right now. Two other areas that I think are interesting um, that were both developed, sorry, just over the river, I don't have my exact Boston um, geography, but we work with two entrepreneurs out of MIT. One is the founder of Jerry Joy, which is an avatar-based um, remote caregiving and remote monitoring solution. Um, it's an avatar with a dog on it. The dog stays the same all the time. On the back end, on the other side of the world, there's a care call center doing text to voice interaction with the resident or the person in their home. And again, they change the care ratio 12 to one. So I can have one um, caregiver monitoring and overseeing 12 people for $250 a month um, for round the clock care. That's not all someone's gonna need, but that can certainly augment and be kind of eyes and ears there all the time. And then we just invested in a company called Jibo, which is a social robotics company here um, out of MIT and the launched by Cynthia Brazil, the founder of the um, MIT Personal Robotics Lab. And I think addressing isolation, thinking about how we could have some companionship, some kind of concierge services that really help, I think it all comes down to connecting and empowering independence. And I think robotics and social robotics could be a big piece of that. I think we're a ways off from like hands-on care robots lifting anybody, but I think robot companions that help us stay connected is an area that I'm particularly excited about. 
great question. Um, before, I have three comments on that, but before that, since there were so many entrepreneurs in the room when Ben asked earlier, I wanted to point out ClearCare's largest angel investor, who you can talk to, and he also exclusively invests in aging. And JB Lyon just walked in the room. If you're an entrepreneur seeking angel investor, right there. He's far from the door, which is great. And he's far from the door, exactly. So, uh, great question. Um, I had three thoughts that came to mind um, in terms of for, um, on uh, the labor force, uh, brain health, and, um, and also trends. So in terms of the labor force, on a micro level, to echo a little bit of what Katie is saying, um, you know, TaskRabbit, between one-fourth to one-third of their TaskRabbiters uh, are seniors. I think there's an opportunity this is, I guess, the name of our panel. Um, I think there's a market opportunity, especially as um, boomers and even the silent war generation um, get more adept with technology. Uh, KB recommended a service called Zirtual to me, which I can't live without now. But to do something like a Zirtual um, with the labor force, as you're seeing the trend in TaskRabbit, to create um, a labor force um, enable kind of an, um, this sort of maybe baby boomer and up labor force um, to provide services for others, be it older or frankly younger. On a macro level, it's been interesting. This last year, um, I've, uh, I've worked with two countries, one East Asian country and one Western European country, who's looking at their labor shortage um, problem because of the aging demographic. And uh, the answer for both has been immigration reform. So on a macro level, McKinsey just came out with a McKinsey report on the aging demographic and what it means in terms of labor shortages and the uh, resulting decrease in productivity. It's a free report, so, uh, and it's pretty good. I'm biased though. On brain health, uh, I was really fortunate because the section mate who sat next to me in section D here is now the CFO of Lumosity, which is one of the foremost companies in brain health. It's interesting because they beat posit science in terms of market traction, despite posit science having a lot more research, which is probably telling. But um, Krishna, I asked him one time, and he said his brain health tool is actually pretty evenly used between ages 20 and 80, which I thought was interesting. My bias was that it was probably 50 up, 65 up, um, like posit sciences was. But it's actually not. He says it's pretty evenly used. However, the drop-off rate is higher for younger people on the market, <coughs> which I think is interesting. Um, I think brain health, there's a big, um, there's a big um, opportunity here. One of my investors said uh, that the three areas he would invest in in aging is something that makes you prettier, smarter, or have sex better. <laughs> and I think that's probably true. <laughs> The last area in terms of trends is I would completely agree with Katie in terms of um, everyone talks about ACOs, um, including one of my clients, lots of excitement from ACOs, but they want to do things in a risk-based way right now, which is very risky for startups, which are inherently already very risky. But to echo this gentleman's um, notion on Medicaid, I've been seeing really interesting things on the Medicaid side uh, for new businesses. Um, Oregon Medicaid, uh, they're called CCOs there, are very interested in funding this area. And then to Katie's point about bundle payments, Arkansas Medicaid has been uh, very innovative on their bundle payments. Tennessee is starting to copy that, and you'll see some other states. So one of the trends that I'm seeing is in actually CCOs versus ACOs as leading in this space. Um, so I come at it from a little different perspective because of the market um, we serve. But uh, so I was in D.C. last week with our lobbyists, talking with different government agencies and different organizations that serve the <coughs> government, and trying to figure out why technology and aging is not resonating among the agencies that actually serve the U.S. population. And one of the problems that that we we see and we see time again from agency to agency is that they're reducing their physical presence of how they're serving um, U.S. citizens. So Social Security is closing offices. Um, IRS is have less physical agents that you can go to visit. Every agency is reducing the amount of hands-on service they're giving to the U.S. citizens. 
but they haven't figured out a way to serve seniors and boomers better because they're not replacing the physical presence, okay, with improved technologies to better serve um, boomers and seniors. And so there's a real disconnect in DC. There's a lot of focus around ADA, um, around 508, Section 508 compliance, um, Section 503 around um, hiring 7% of the workforce as individuals with disabilities, but there's very little dialogue going on in D.C. around how to better serve boomers and seniors. I'm not talking about Medicaid and Medicare. Um, I'm talking about just basic services within the government. Um, the other thing that I see as a, as a big trend from not the, not the seniors today, but as the boomers, the boomers in this room like myself, that have grown up with technology, their expectations of what they're going to get um, when they get older is they don't consider themselves to have a problem. Okay, Just because they're losing their sight, they're still going to expect the same services and the same access and the same ability to do the things that they were, with, they were younger. And the whole concept of universal design supports that, but it's not progressing as fast as the boomers are, are basically becoming seniors. And so I think there's a huge opportunity for companies to, to use the latest technology to better serve the, you know, the individuals. Books on the problem of it, but that can be part of the solution on the workforce side as well, I think is a really important one and really efficient. We know lots of people are trying to figure out how to finance longevity and lots of people have needs. And so I think that's a really elegant solution. Um, and I think Posit Science and Lumosity, there's a really good entrepreneurship lesson there, I think, which is um, Posit started first. They had to do a ton of research to kind of prove out and educate the consumer about the whole idea of neuroplasticity, which is a really expensive proposition for a startup, you know, to have to teach the science. Lumosity got to come in later and kind of ride on that. And to the extent you can let a big company be doing some market education on something, and then you just do your niche for seniors, is a lot more efficient way to do it. And then I think the other thing that Lumosity did is they, I think it's always important to design for the senior and understand their need and make sure your product works for them, but that doesn't necessarily mean you need to market it overtly to them. You could just solve a subtle need that they will identify that they have, and but it didn't have to be Lumosity brain fitness for seniors, it was just brain fitness, and they opened themselves up to a much larger market. And I think in the Boeing video we saw, you saw the same thing where they learned those lessons about accessibility and use by working with older adults who might have mobility challenges, but then what they saw was all the downstream ageless design benefits that everybody's going to enjoy not hassling with their luggage and having a more streamlined experience. So I think it's a delicate thing in our space with how much you understand the needs of the senior versus how much you market directly to it. That was great. Um, top right. My right. Right there. Thank you. Um, you know, I know this is all about opportunity, but I want to just get your opinion and your feedback on what I see as roadblocks and, and barriers, really societal bar barriers. You know, from my, my observation is that, is that aging and specifically senior care is a crisis driven event that, uh, that creates in market buyers. And yet, those buyers, when they're in marketplace, have there's two really difficult challenges to overcome right now. And one is consumer payments. To what the aging issues are, what the aging resources are, what the aging solutions are. And probably more importantly is the denial, the consumer denial on the age on the part of the parent. So how do you deal with that interesting paradox of trying to relying on a crisis in order to create in market buyers and all that built up consumer ignorance in society with these ignorance of aging issues? How do you knock that down as entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs that build businesses around the aging markets? <laughs> it's a, a very tough one, um, and I'll tell you from the lifeline perspective that we've been challenged by that situation and have been successful because of it. Um, and the success uh, uh, picture is, uh, you know, nobody wants that service. Nobody. Um, and then they get the service after they've had that crisis, um, that teachable moment of I lived through something and I never want to experience it again, or my friend didn't live through something and I don't want my kids or me to have to live through that. 
Um, and we were able to ride on that theme for, um, you know, it's now 40 years that we've been successful um, reaching consumers after that event. But we haven't really found a way to get through the perception of that service and that it's not for me. It's for her with the four-point walker who's had five falls versus me who's had two uneventful falls, but I know that I've changed. Um, so I don't really know the answer to your question because it is a strange dilemma. I hypothesize a little bit that um, hopefully boomers who have taken charge of so many things in their lives are going to plan better and be more open to things than their parents have been. But I don't know if aging and becoming old like that will really change human behavior all that much that we will see a change in being preventative or pre-planned. I think one trend that we're seeing, um, so I work with a lot of assisted living providers, and Brookdale's the largest one in the country, and I think if you look at the name of their their logo, they've actually changed it recently. It used to say Brookdale Senior Living, and now it says Brookdale Senior Living Solutions, or Senior, Senior Solutions. So I think we're seeing a lot of people move to, we know everyone's pushing off that move-in date to the trigger. Um, we're seeing average move-in, age of move-in increase and increase, like 83, 84. Um, so I think two things are changing. One, the providers of those solutions are trying to figure out how can they go upstream and start offering you things before you move in, whether that's moving to a beyond-the-wall strategy, whether that's helping with kind of care navigation and things you might need help with before. Or I think transportation is a really obvious first place to start, um, to start a relationship with someone, maybe when they start stop feeling comfortable driving at night. And that might be five or ten years before they move in, but if your company can start helping solve those problems early, then I think there's you can start a relationship that's not so um, emergency driven. And then I think the other is there really weren't alternatives. Part of why people, I think, have been putting off moving in is because we weren't giving them other things to buy or solve these problems in the home. And so I think now things like remote monitoring and these solutions, if people don't want to move in so badly, then these solutions that are now available that weren't, might, they might be more willing to purchase, especially if someone else starts paying for it. <laughs> We're getting in a rut, but going this way, so yeah, I'm going to hand to Mark to go. Okay, so, so as a business, um, we actually acknowledge the denial, and we actually tr try to provide assistance without the individual actually realizing they're getting it. Um, and so it needs to be so simple, intuitive, and easy. I mean, if you look at what Apple has done in their OS about providing assistance to seniors and, and people with difficulties online, it just happens. It's just get better. I mean, just imagine how beautiful the pinch and unpinch is versus what it was a few years ago. And so by taking your approach of realizing that nobody wants to admit that they need help and just building it into the products. I agree with Mark. Um, I don't think you can overcome the societal barrier, the denial. So as an entrepreneur or intrapreneur, um, I don't think it's our place to be changing that or to Katie's point, spending marketing dollars on it from a lot of the companies and startups that I've talked to, um, the average customer acquisition cost in this space is two to, two to $400 per customer, right? So if you're gonna make something, you gotta make more than that to cover your just customer acquisition costs. Um, and maybe Katie may have, probably does have more information on that than I do. Um, but the one anecdote I can tell you is when I used to run a retirement community, we had 2,000 seniors uh, living in this retirement community is a big one. Um, and we had, uh, we, we like to have residents give our tours um, and be our tour guides. And one of our residents was 102 years old and she was a fantastic tour guide. You know, she walked, uh, we had two million square feet built out. She walked the whole thing, she knew all the halls, she loved to tour, she was very articulate. She's a former pediatrician, so very, very, very good. Except then you had this perception that, oh, you know, all these 93 and 95 year olds started saying, oh, I'm too young to move in. I mean, she's 102. So we asked her to do something else. Uh, and we found that the, 
we found that the best thing in marketing was actually not so much um, going against that a societal perception, but using human behavior to our advantage. So we would then start telling people, we have 1,500 people on the waiting list. And it was going to be seven year wait if you wanted a two bedroom unit. And wow, did people sign up. And that 1,500 increased to 1,800. We were able to build a sister community, another 100 acre community nearby, and moved, um, I forget, 500 or 800 people over from our waiting list over. It was, that was what helped us. It was using human behavior of scarcity and then wanting to sign up because of that. Um, yep, go ahead. possibility of increasing cross-sector collaborations. Um, I'm from the nonprofit sector, but uh, learning more about business. But the government is broken. The for-profit sector is doing its thing. Nonprofit sector is like what I call it, like a care bear culture that doesn't have a clue about the bottom line. So, but right now, what I'm hearing is it's really the opportunity for cross-sector, you know, collaborations um, to leverage the nonprofit community base, base communities. Can you speak about that a little bit from your experience? Or? So we have, actually, we have a lot of experience with that because we don't have a, we're a technology company. We, we don't have a lot of salespeople. Um, so what we've done is we've partnered with associations and nonprofit in different sectors to enable their websites um, with what we think is progressive technology and best practice to then, then they demonstrate it to the, the sectors that they're trying to serve. So basically, we, we don't have a big marketing budget, but the time and energy that we put into it actually has been like um, basically supporting nonprofits and, and, and industry associations that no one in this room has probably ever heard of to basically then generate leads from big organizations because they see it on um, nonprofit websites that they see as kind of you know leading the charge in their specific sector. And we see a lot of that with Beijing 2.0. It was kind of part of why we started our broader network is that I think we were seeing a lot of silos across the care coordination, or the care continuum. So we'd see a home care conference and an assisted living conference. And, and then we'd see the private pay version of that or the, you know, the nonprofit version and the for-profit version of that. And frankly, everybody's serving seniors and thinking about a lot of the same things. Uh, so we've been trying to break down those walls, especially because in a lot of cases across the continuum, everyone's moving into each other's stuff anyways, you know, every assisted living, starting a home care business, and so I, one of the ethos of what we try to do is really believing that this is going to take interdisciplinary and intergenerational collaboration if we're going to get this right, and um, part of that is getting those people in the same room, because they were all <laughs> going to different conferences, and, um, and I think another piece we try to add in is also the technology and the business community. Um, you know, when I kind of wear my three hats between business, technology, and aging, I was going to three completely different types of conferences, and that's what we try to bring together. Um, and so I think for nonprofits, especially many of whom are having their own funding issues and looking for new revenue streams, you know, I think models around venture philanthropy, models around having a private pay component to what you do, um, models around perhaps reseller agreements with a lot of these startups who are trying to reach a, a group you already serve, I think there's tremendous potential and, and really need that the nonprofits have that last mile, which is really distribution is the biggest challenge in this space. I'll just add to Katie, and I think that last point is uh, extremely valid in terms of that last mile. The other thing is um, most nonprofits need support in doing what they do well, which is not only the last mile of care, but the last mile or the first mile in educating. And it's really uh, working with the for-profit organizations to help you be educators, to be influencers, and, and to um, help make markets together. I think that's part of the key. Another, I think, really great opportunity for nonprofits is we mentioned the need to prove outcomes, and a lot of times there's grant money that can help support an outcome study of a new technology, and I think that's a really concrete way that nonprofits and tech startups can collaborate, or big tech companies, because you guys can write the grant, <laughs> that, but then have a tech partner um, to help do the study. And so, I mean, I spent, I spent time running two nonprofits, and you're always, I always felt like, as the head of the organization, I was always looking raising money, asking for money, begging for money. And that's why I, I kind of moved back into the, the private sector. 
But as so as a former CEO of a nonprofit, I would say don't underestimate the value that you actually can offer companies. Um, and don't be embarrassed to ask for them to pay for it. Um, because most nonprofits just want to do good work. Okay, but you gotta in order to do that good work, you gotta make money. Um, I talk too much, so I'm gonna pass it on. Time is nine, so I think that the panels will maybe hang out for a few more minutes and we can ask them questions individually. Uh, so, but I will leave with one quick question that you can go around with and answer as quickly as you want to. What is your best idea to make money? <laughs> Jacqueline's three sounded pretty good. I'm very disappointed this startup failed last year. <laughs> I was very excited about the idea. Um, and I, I think there's room for an alternative health plan. My old company had a Medicare Advantage plan that covered massages, that covered you know food, transportation, you know things that support life, which is actually what seniors need. The thing that frustrated me the most about being a student and trying to uh, here at HBS and trying to find a job in aging is everyone directed me to healthcare, and that's only a small part of aging. It's really about life, and because life doesn't go right, then you have to get healthcare. So I think there's room for an alternative health plan. So it's an integrated payer, provider, and life system. Uh, that's a billion dollar opportunity. Um, well, I'm a, essentially a pre-revenue, private equity funded venture, and, and I'm trying to figure out that, that <laughs> question. <laughs> but my startup failed because no one would buy it, though. So if you want to talk more about that, I'm happy to. <laughs> I mean, I'm probably most excited about, I think, the potential to bring these Uberization on-demand models into caregiving. And that, I think, can help on both the staffing and supply side of who's a caregiver, and also help bring down the cost and accessibility of care in the community. And one of the areas that I think is really under-resourced and investigated is the whole area of medication adherence. So uh, what our CVS uh, doctor was talking about earlier, I think is a real cry need and is often the reason for successful aging in place versus need to go to skilled nursing is the ability to stay adherent to medication regimes. Great. Thank you everybody for sticking around. I know this uh, last one is a little longer. have one statement before you go on my thoughts on the definition of old. If you're over 40, 40 and you have teenagers, you're old. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs>